Well, good day. This is Thursday, June the 4th, and I appreciate your presence and participation in Noonday Prayers, beginning on page 103 in the Book of Common Prayer. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. This day I thought we would say together Psalm 121. You just turn the page, it's on page 104. I lift up my eyes to the hills, from where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I am in the midst of a very short course on Wednesday evenings, a webinar looking at the letter to the Philippians. It's very much on my mind, therefore, so I wanted to read a passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians um, as our uh, scripture reflection for Noonday Prayers today. This is beginning at verse 1 of chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, a passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians, and as I was sharing in a um, teaching on this just last night, uh, those familiar uh, verses, if you have your Bible open, if you look at it later today, and I hope you will, uh, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, uh, are considered to be one of the very earliest, if not the earliest, creedal statement of the church about the person of Christ. This is a, uh, a summary, if you will, of God's missional um, dive into God's creation to redeem creation, humanity, uh, from ourselves. And it looks like a different kind of God than we might expect who comes into um, his creation to set things to rights uh, by force, by power, by privilege. Uh, it looks like Jesus of Nazareth, who though he was in the form of God, though he in his inner being and outer being was actually God, God as God is when he becomes human, was obedient to this mission that led him to death on the cross, taking upon himself all that we ourselves had wrought upon our, our own bodies and lives and destiny, sin 
and death. It is hard to overstate uh, the beauty, the power, and the importance of these verses um, for an understanding of who Christ was. And if we had more time, I could probably preach for a half an hour or more. My interest today is simply to highlight this section of Scripture, this, this, this part of Paul's letter to the Philippians for your own contemplation, uh, especially in light of what we're going on, um, what we're all going through in these days, which are terribly disconcerting. Uh, we've been talking about um, growing division in our culture and our society for years now here at St. George's and how we could be a, a healing agent, a bright light in the midst of um, what seems to be a gathering darkness. And then we had this shocking thing happen over the last three months, this COVID-19 pandemic, which has knocked everybody off of their sense of equilibrium. And now, of course, um, reactions to uh, the horrible killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, uh, which followed other examples of um, violent racial injustice that's still alive in our cultural life even after what we assumed was so much progress toward justice and racial equality. There is a poem that is so often quoted in times of chaos and upheaval. I've used it myself at times. And it's William Butler Yeats's famous poem written almost exactly 100 years ago called The Second Coming. These will be words that are familiar to you, I'm sure. In the poem, the first stanza, Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I'm struck by that line as I often am. The center cannot hold. Uh, I was reading in an essay where someone else was referring to Yeats's poem recently, and he reminded me that this line in the poem is not about sort of a, the center being defined as sort of political moderation, uh, although it would be great if we had a deeper expression of that in our cultural life right now. No, what Yeats seems to be getting at in the poem when he says the center cannot hold is those who are themselves centered in what matters the most. Um, those who are grounded themselves in ultimate truth, if you will. And that hymn that I read to you from Paul's letter to the, to the Philippians, that Christological passage, soaring verses, represents the center of that correspondence. And so sharing again in my teaching on it, it's like the beating heart of the letter, the beating heart of the letter, uh, and it pumps blood into chapter one and everything that follows it after chapter two. Everything kind of connects back to this part of the correspondence. And so I think the call for us is to translate what that means for us in a world like this that we're dealing with right now. And that has to begin with each individual person. Understanding that our center of gravity, when it feels like everything else is in upheaval, is Christ. And Paul says, have the mind of Christ. A better translation might be, cultivate a consciousness that your engagement with the world is as one who belongs to Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality of, with God as something to be exploited, to take advantage of. Those of us who have the privilege, those of us who have the power, this is a time more than ever before, at least that I can think of, where we just simply need to lay that down. Um, we may not have the answers, but we can be part of the answers to the upheaval in our culture if we Remember, the ground of our being, the center, is Jesus, because ultimately he is the only one, the only one who has the power to heal our divisions, to heal our injustices, to bring love 
where there is suspicion and even hatred. And his love takes the form of death on the cross. And again, I invite you with me to translate what that looks like in very real practical terms for your life as well as for my own in this church. That's heavy, I know, but I believe that is our call this day and in the days to come. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. In our St. George's community today, we pray for the following. For Dick, Betty, Kevin, Jessica, Elizabeth, Luke, Margaret, Tim, Allison, Timmy, Max, Allison, Scott, Lauren, Ann Towery, and McLean, as well as any others you may wish to name now, silently or aloud. Blessed Savior, at this hour you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may look to you and be saved for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>